the QSKJQS1235CCBA-100W. It's a DC to DC boost converter that I picked up on eBay for eleven dollars. And for eleven dollars a claimed one hundred watt output while being shipped in a metal case is rather impressive. It also includes a little adapter which seems to be of reasonable quality, definitely nothing to complain about, and the unit also supports constant current mode. I have to be honest, I don't expect the inside of this thing to look very impressive, because you can in general pick something equivalent up, well something with equivalent claimed specifications for about twice the price without a case coming from China. So there's probably going to be something rather dodgy inside. I have tested this unit as far as I know that you can adjust the output voltage. It uh, is not broken, so props to them for not sending me a broken unit. But I figured before we get into any kind of real testing on it, we'd take it apart just to see how horrible it looks on the inside. I have now removed the four end screws which held on the cover plate. I have not checked the yet uh, peeked inside. So, here we go. And at first glance, that actually looks rather decent. We've got two TO220 transistors, or could be a diode and a transistor, both screwed down to the actual casing, and a inductor which seems to be I'd say that looks capable of handling what they claim. It even seems to be tacked down to the PCB using some gunk. Hmm. The remaining screws have been removed. We can spot two large capacitors in there and two ten turn pots of probably questionable quality. The board seems to just slide out the end. Here it comes. Ooh, that's a nice tight fit I have to say. The casing seems to be of okay quality. Extruded aluminium of course. And here are our Chong brand caps. 35 volt on that one. And the other one seems to be identical, even though I can't spot the number on it. The potentiometers... They look creepily similar to Bond's pots, but... Yeah, I strongly doubt those are brand name pots. Strongly doubt it. And, oh my, here's the action side. This actually looks surprisingly well built. I was not expecting to see any surface mount component whatsoever. And above all, not what seems to be linear technology I see. Very impressed. Is that another? Brand name I see, I believe that's a brand name I see, I think I recognize that logo. Very decent silver in quality. Very decent everything. These devices are ST branded? How on earth do you get an ST branded device in something like this? The other one's an ST as well. They even look genuine. Well, no, not this one. The right one is definitely a fake. <laughs> yeah, but this one's a fake, fake ST. That's not the proper logo, but. 
This one actually looks rather convincing. I believe I've seen that part number before, but it could be fake. Good chance it's fake. Surprised they went to the effort of actually getting fake devices though. Little silkscreen QSKG mark there. And that's pretty much all they wrote. This is, seems to be the current sense resistor. This is obviously some kind of switching transistor. Perhaps I should try getting some light in there. And this one of these chips is going to be a controller. Okay, so if we take a bit of a closer look on this device, we've got our input terminals here, positive and negative. Uh, the positive terminal goes through these vias to an upper plane and then straight to the input cap, uh, this pin. And the ground goes through this FET, which acts as uh, polarity protection. So if you hook up your battery or power source to this device back to front, it simply will act as an open circuit if, unless the voltage is so high that it's enough to blow this device. That's a very good way of implementing reverse polarity protection. It has a fair bit less loss than just using a series diode and you don't need a fuse as you would if you had a backwards uh, diode as you do on the output. So, on the output you do have the classic reverse diode polarity protection, so if you hook up a battery back to front on the output, uh, it'll essentially try and draw the all the current you have, and there's no current limiting as you can see here, so the output jack goes straight to a diode, so this will probably go pop if you <laughs> hook something which can deliver current up the wrong way. There doesn't seem to be any other pr output protection on this device. You've got uh, the output of the rectifier, an STPS20 dual 10 amp rectifier going straight to the output capacitor, which is indeed 35 volt rated as the primary side one. I did notice when I powered this off that you could actually set the output voltage higher than 35 volts, so you shouldn't do that unless you wish to clean the inside of a capacitor off the inside of your case. Otherwise on the output there's really not a whole lot to talk about. We've got footprints for two ceramic caps, we only populated one. This is the output current sense resistor, this is the input current sense resistor. And pretty much everything is done by this linear technology, probably clone IC and uh, this LN358 op-amp which seems to be buffering one of the potentiometers and probably doing some funny Chinese op-amp magic. Uh, the switching device and ST something or the other I can't see it through the viewfinder is an 80 amp uh, I believe 80 volt device so it should be sufficient for this device by far. Uh, I'd almost believe that they've specified a lesser device but they've used a very high spec ST clone in order to get reasonable reliability of it. All in all I'm very impressed by this device even after spending maybe 15 minutes actually looking into how it's built. In general you've got lots of VS all over uh, hooking together ground planes and power planes and what have you the soldering quality is impressively good all around. Just look at, looking at the input connector, it's damn near perfect. You, you, you would find soldering of this quality in a Sony product or something of the likes. However, it does have a bit of solder splatter in its places, but that's no big deal. They've probably been tested before being sent out at some stage. The general layout is also quite well well made. We've got very thick traces where they need to be thick. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to say about the inside of this unit. These LEDs are... Pr this one is power on. I would believe this one is constant current limiting. 
but I have not tested that, so we will find that out shortly. And that'll be it. We'll have to see if it survives testing. One minor complaint about the build of this unit is that the tolerances for the transistor rectifier to the case as well as the sill pads to actually align and fit where they're supposed to are quite tight and you can see that there's a bit of metal showing in there so there's reasonable risk of these transistors actually touching the case which might not be catastrophic but yeah that's not really too good but if only one of them touches it shouldn't make too much of a difference the case isn't connected anywhere just a minor note alright so now I've got a quick and easy dirty test bench set up for this device uh, we've got the device itself hooked up to my one of my power tubes over there which I've tuned to give exactly 12 volts at the input of this device under load and here's the input current, output voltage and output current. Now I've set this thing to the rated output power 100 watts uh, into an 8 ohm resistor onto my bench and uh, I just did the efficiency calculation and uh, it's uh, dissipating about 107 watts uh, in total so we've got uh, pretty much 7 watts of loss in this thing which is turning it not catastrophically hot but yeah it's you wouldn't want to grasp it in your hand you can touch it but I'd say that's somewhere around 50 degrees hot and it's still climbing I would say However, that means we've got an efficiency of uh, around 93% under full load, which is quite respectable. In fact, very respectable for something that cost $11 and came in, came in a nice case. However, what's uh, less respectable is the output noise. Because I've got my scope set to 200 millivolts per division and it's hooked right to the output, not perfectly, but good enough for something like this and we've got 200, 400, 600, 800, 1000, over 1 volt of ripple on the output and that is... Uh, yeah, that's that's just not acceptable really uh, this, this device needs further filtering on the output in order to actually be called a 100 watt uh, device Ripple goes down quite linearly if we turn the output power down. You can see we're at 45 volts out, I don't know what our input. Well, now we're at 60 watts incoming. And we're at uh, pretty much half the ripple at, let's see here, 24600. 600 millivolts of ripple. Well, that's still on the high side, so in its stock configuration, I'd say this thing can do, I don't know, perhaps 20 30 watts while maintaining some kind of clean output power. That's 4 amps going in, and it's starting to clean up a bit. Anyway, you can't expect a very good performance, and you can see in this, on the inside that they had left out quite a few filtering components, so you could probably do with adding that. To extra ceramic capacitor and perhaps even an external coil on the output to just clean the power coming out of it up, up a bit. Something I did notice however was that uh, the current limiter works quite well. If we turn it back up it's getting uncomfortably hot to the touch by now. Right up to 100 watts again, there we go, a bit over. And if some poor power supplies will get quite ripply when they are current limiting, however, if we turn the current limiter on, the ripple stays quite the same. So, 
props to that. We've still got to check any power on overshoot as well as I can with my home gear. But uh, this thing could potentially make a decent LED driver, which is for what I actually intended to use it. Now it is only a boost converter so you're going to have to use a rather high voltage LED with it. Its lowest output voltage is 12 volts as stated on the actual box of the device. So I plotted a thermal sensor underneath the unit right by the transistor and diode and it's getting a bit toasty to say the least. The unit is um, really too hot to touch. You, you you would get burned if you tried to grab it. <laughs> so, if you actually want to use this as a, what's it say, 100 watt unit, then you better add some better heat sinking to it. Uh, it's also starting to smell nicely of burning plastic. So, yeah, not a hundred watts not by long shot. And it would be a rather pointless device if it couldn't handle some line voltage variations so I've got this meter hooked up to measure the input voltage this one's measuring the output voltage and this one's still measuring the input current so I'm just gonna have a play around with that And it's not having a problem. Very nice. Now well, let's give the constant current mode the same treatment. There's a bit more play, but I'd say that's acceptable given that what kind of device this is. Now I've got the power supply, or well, the boost regulator, adjusted for a constant current of 2.5 amps and a constant voltage of uh, 28.3 volts. Uh, that means that we're going to, we should get around 19 volts going into our 8 ohm load. And I'm going to plug the device in to see if we get any kind of overshoot. My meter is in crest mode, so even a rather quick spike should appear. And nothing happened. Hmm, I think we might have tasted it. No, that was just my power supply going into protection mode for some reason. Probably had the voltage set a bit too high, it's a bit iffy. Anyway, here we go. Oh. That's not pretty. It definitely overshot quite severely. So that could be an issue if you're going to be driving LEDs with it. Because no one knows how large that current spike actually is. Uh, hang on, I might try and measure it actually. Right, I've got my good meter hooked up uh, in series with the output now and you can see our set current here 2.44 amps so if we're going to crest mode and kill the power almost want to reset that there we go let's see what we get ooh almost 4 amps that's quite a far, sh far shot long shot from 2.44 uh, that could potentially kill an LED. Okay, I've now added a 100 microhenry inductor in series with the output, so let's see if that will do us any good. Nope. This device seems to be rather set on overshooting at power on. Alright, I've now added a 1000 microfarad capacitor on the output in addition to the large inductor, so we've got a proper LC filter going on now which could do a bit of good. Nope. The sad truth is if you want a well-regulated current regulator you are simply going to have to splurge for a slightly more high-end version. 
However, the extra filtering does clean out up the output quite considerably. We've got uh, pretty much five millivolts of ripple and noise in the sensible frequency band on this thing at the 100 watt load compared to over a volt without the external filter. These short peaks are just very high frequency switching noise which you they are above 20 megahertz definitely so they should not be included in a noise measurement they're just here because my cheap scope doesn't have a bandwidth limiter but yeah an external filter on the output can give you decently clean output in constant voltage mode so that's at least something is it short circuit protected? I'm using a 2 ohm series resistor on the input just in case it decides to short out so I don't have 40 amps going through it here goes nothing It's looking quite alright. However, we can see that it's not going into constant current mode. It's simply dragging the input voltage down as far as it can. So, I'm not entirely sure if I would call this a short circuit protected device. I'm not too keen on actually get it straight up to the power supply and uh, shorting it out this isn't too confidence instilling no I just set the current limit to the absolute minimum value possible and whatever you do it still just draws enough current to uh, essentially short its input out so Really, I would not call this a short circuit protected device, even though it has current limiting, it can't handle getting its output voltage drawn too low. Since it only is a boost converter, it uh, can't, its output voltage can't be lower than its input voltage, and it seems to essentially freak out if that happens. When I was doing a bit of experimentation, on the 4 amp supply there I got it to essentially uh, latch up uh, and uh, just uh, sit on in a mode where it would draw the output voltage of the power supply down so far that it was unable to start properly and uh, yeah it, it just never got out of that uh, mode until I unplugged it and uh, changed the output voltage or current setting to one where it was able to regulate properly so you, if you get one of these you need to be mindful that you actually <laughs> know what kind of load you're driving uh, you, you need to make sure that the voltage will always be higher than the input voltage and uh, that uh, the battery or whatever you have actually has enough juice to power it because it just doesn't seem to respond very well to uh, parameters out of bounds so to speak too low input voltage too high output voltage and so forth alright so now let's see what happens if uh, we give it a low voltage condition I'm using my 4 amp lab power supply for this test because I don't want to risk having this thing giving everything it's got to <laughs> into that little thing it would not leave a whole lot left so I've got it uh, set its current limiting at the moment at 15.9 volts so I'm just gonna slowly turn the voltage down and you can see the input current on the right input voltage in the middle it's specified to work up down to 5 volts so we're getting pretty close to that
and the it took a bit of a jump and uh, went to, started current limiting my power supply at 4 amps and this is the latch up condition that I was talking about earlier because with everything connected up like this if I try to reset the thing it will not start even if I turn the voltage up it will not start it just sits there and draws as much current as it can you could see it working fine at 12 and a half or so volts but yeah if the load's connected it just can't do it so I have to turn the load off before actually turning the power supply on like that and then it will be fine so that could be a bit of an issue if you've got it hooked up weirdly to some weak-ish battery or something and it just can't manage to start and then try shorting your battery out more or less but yeah that's a rather unusual scenario and yeah really for, for the price you still can't blame this little thing for <laughs> being a bit unstable and uh, dangerous now as for efficiency this unit really is quite surprising uh, I had to check my a testing setup several times in order to uh, verify that these results were actually accurate because frankly it's over 90% efficient even if you overload it by 40% so I did this test with practically an infinite kind of uh, or infinite amount of different scenarios you could use this device but I settled for just using an 8 ohm resistive load on the output and uh, uh, just changing the output voltage accordingly so we have a hundred watts at about 29 volts and so forth you're free to pause the video if you want to watch the entire chart in detail I'm not going to get into it I even plotted it out there now somewhat intriguingly it is the most efficient under the least load so make of that what you will something's got rather high high resistance. These efficiency measurements should also be reasonably accurate since I did compensate both for voltage drop in the input cables and voltage drop in the output cables going to the load so I haven't just calculated with oh I'll set my power supply to 12 volt and then have 11.6 coming into the actual inverter and I'll set my load to 8 ohms and have 8.5 actually loading down the device also checked uh, <laughs> with uh, different meters and cross -referen referenced a bit going mostly off of just one meter my good one and no shoddy clamp meters or anything have been involved so the confidence level in these uh, results should be fairly good and I mean at low loads you're over 95 percent efficient so, for something like an LED driver, hey, that is a nice number, you can't contest. So, it's the QSKJ QS1235CCBA 100 W. A goodbye. Well, I would say so as long as you are aware of its limitations because this device practically needs an external output filter in order to have anywhere near acceptable output power quality and uh, frankly it runs a bit too hot to, for comfort when it comes to high load scenarios although you can overload it to 140 watts uh, for a little while and it'll be fine so it's really rather well-built device for its price class. I mean, I paid $11 for this. That's frankly amazing. And there's some of my thermal compound. Off we go. 
And uh, yeah, one of the most attractive things you could do with this is use it in an LED driver since it's got the constant current mode. However, you are going to have to adjust the output voltage very, uh, very carefully if you're going to try and use it as such, since it will spike to practically the, out the set output voltage before it begins current limiting. But if you can adjust the output voltage to be just above the maximum voltage drop you're going to expect over your LEDs and cables, yeah, it could be. It could do as decently as an LED driver, especially if it's an LED which is uh, on for the most part and doesn't get turned off very often. Because it is high efficiency at uh, lowish medium load, and I don't think you're easily going to find a cheaper boost converter with uh, comparable uh, comparable efficiency that's able to drive an LED. So, yeah, all in all. I guess it's going to have to get a thumbs up, but yeah, recommend using an external output filter. I use some of these components lying around here. Probably this 1000 microfarad capacitor and something like this 100 micro Henry coil in series. Could possibly deal with a slightly smaller coil, but 100 micro Henry, 1000 microfarad seem to work fine for me. And that'll be it. Cheerio, hope you enjoyed the video.